All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the eighth house, Desire, Confrontation, and Power. This is a part of our ongoing uh, house series. So the eighth house is obviously correspondent to Scorpio and Pluto. When we're looking at the eighth house, we're dealing with the entire realm of life experience that corresponds to facing our inner psychology, coming to face our greatest psychological weaknesses, our deepest fears, our deepest insecurities, where there is a deep permeating sense of vulnerability within this human life condition. What's very easy in the eighth house is to take one of two stances, either avoid the things that are really uncomfortable for us. So it's sort of holding on to a sense or a feeling or um, an experience of sovereignty, but it's not entirely true. But it's just to resist and avoid and not really be in relationship with the experiences of the people, the processes that will shake us to our core. Or it's to get involved in it, but to give up our power. And to say, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, stay in this relationship or stay in this job and, you know, just let it kind of lead me and do whatever they want me to do or who, be whoever they want me to be. Persisting in a situation, but not really claiming one's power, not really confronting it and dealing with what needs to be seen. These two dynamics of giving up one's power and not doing the work reflects this one eighth house expression of powerlessness, but also just the energy of living life in a way that we're not in touch with our capacity to choose, where we're not in touch with our inherent capacity to orient our intention towards evolution, towards our own soul growth, and to do whatever is necessary accordingly. Or the resistance of like, oh, I don't want to deal with this, is that eighth house expression also of not really knowing our own power to evolve, not knowing and not claiming our capacity to orient to our soul growth and do what's necessary. The, the challenge in the eighth house is self-confrontation. So all the ways in which we might avoid self-confrontation, either by avoiding the situations or not really doing the work while we're in them. At the core, when we're confronting our own self, when we're willing to face our own self, there's this thing that happens. The outer reality, the object reality of people and circumstances and situations and relationships become less important. It becomes less about the thing that we're struggling with on the outside. And in our struggles, it's all about desire. And desire will always manifest as craving and aversion. It becomes less about the object that we're focused on, the thing that we want to get away from, that we're averted or really triggered by, or the thing that we're craving, the thing that we're needing, that we're obsessed with, that we can't let go of. And that obsession, right, that isn't always, I'm trying to hold on to something. It could also be, I'm so attached, I'm so identified with being approved of or being accepted or being wanted that I'm not willing to find my power because I don't want to risk losing or I don't want to risk the possibility of rejection or abandonment or betrayal. So in this desire dynamic of craving and aversion, as we connect with the energetics of it, like, okay, this is what's happening on the inside. I'm actually really afraid of speaking up to my boss. I'm really afraid of expressing my needs, or I'm really afraid of, you know, sticking around in this relationship because this is actually really uncomfortable. And I can see where my psychological energy is getting hooked, like really hooked. I'm going to lower the gain. I think I might be talking a little too loud. Where my psychological energy can get really hooked in the object focus. This is the whole issue with the eighth house and the Pluto archetype in general. We get so stuck in the object focus that our whole life energy revolves around figuring something out relative to something. <laughs> and we forget the deeper spiritual teaching, which is everything is an emanation from the inner reality of the soul. Everything is reflecting the soul back to itself. Everything is uh, coming from the program of the soul's own evolutionary needs. 
There's nothing that, that manifests in this life. There's nothing that manifests in our life experience that isn't relevant for us because this life isn't some sort of duality where there's like, yeah, I'm evolving, I'm doing my work, but then there's this really hard relationship. There's no such thing as that. Everything is a part of the work. And when we're really in touch with our self-confrontation, our ability to face and meet ourselves dead on, the whole world sort of begins to fall away. And it's somewhat paradoxical because on the one hand, the things of the world, the objects, people, places, experiences, events, that's where all the charge is. That's where all the volatility and the intensity is. And at the same time, the more we face what arises inside of us, the more we see it's actually not about those things. <laughs> These things are just reflecting us, but it's paradoxical because it's like these things won't go away. They stay, they remain. They're always gonna stay with us and match where we are at. And so if we close our eyes and then we open them up again, it's still there, it hasn't gone away. So there is this profound process in the eighth house, and we'll just start to give some examples in a moment, where we're drawing our attention within and facing with a deep honesty. Honesty in general, Sag, ninth house, Jupiter, but honesty in a different way is eighth house, Scorpio, Pluto. The energetic quality of honesty in the eighth house is a, a, a naked meeting of oneself and the willingness to evolve, which means it's sort of a, I'm not gonna bullshit myself kind of honesty. I'm not gonna stay in the struggle and try to stay outside of myself thinking that's where my power, that's where my security will actually come from. In facing it, we'll get what we need to get. It'll sort of, each time we go within, there's more content that arises. That's why in the eighth house, we have relationship with what we can call psychology or working with therapists or working with people who work on a soul level so that they can reflect back to us our own inner soul psychology. It's also why in the eighth house, we have the correlation to relationships where there are strong needs, strong attachments, strong desires, where issues around trust, jealousy, security. Can I open up with you? Can I reveal all of myself or am I going to be betrayed? Can I really let go entirely? And this is that paradox of the eighth house. Like there's no way out, but through. There is no way out, but through. Because since the outer world is reflecting the inner world, we have to appreciate that the outer world will evolve with us. So moving through our experiences and our relationships at the core is an internal process, but the outer world will move along with it. And we're gonna have to appreciate and face the changing content, the changing stimulus in our relationships, in our life experiences, as we go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper within. At the core, the eighth house is bottom line, do you want to evolve or not? Do you want to evolve or not evolve? That basic question will lead the way to everything that's relevant. It'll lead the way to all the things that we need to face about ourselves. So the eighth house points to a predominantly unconscious reality, reflecting the reality of the soul itself. We're not conscious of the content that we're working through because it's unconscious. So it's going to first express itself in the extremities of our life. It's going to reveal itself through how we feel in the circumstantial realities that we all manifest but we become conscious here by probing into, oh, what is it that I'm afraid of? What is it that I'm needing to look at here? So let's look a little more deeply in the idea that there's no way out but through. In the same way that when the snake sheds its skin, it can't see, there's an inherent process to the evolutionary journey where 
in facing our own weaknesses, our own limitations, where power is sourced outside of ourself and kind of just beginning, becoming honest about our inner reality, there's a simultaneous process of not knowing what's going to happen. We can't hold on to our concern with gain and loss. We can't hold on to the person, place, or thing that we don't want to lose and evolve at the same time. So in facing ourselves, we simultaneously realize I can't control anything. The same, we can't resist and run away from the thing that's threatening for ourselves that we feel threatened by and evolve at the same time. In evolving, we realize, oh, there's no running away. And so the eighth house can really bring up the strong feeling of being stuck. If you have a lot of eighth house planets or a strong transit to the eighth house, it's a very common sensation, a feeling of being stuck. That experience of being stuck is just simply a matter of there's no escape here. This is why in the eighth house, there's oftentimes a, a really deep longing for a deeper connection. That's sort of the basis behind like the song, the strong sexual craving, just wanting to go really deep. Because it's actually the soul wanting to break free. This is also why the longing to return home. Right? It's like, I just want to end all of this pain and this tension. It's all born from desire. It's all born from where we go into a consciousness of separation. And then we need to play out this life experience to catch it and return. This energy of feeling stuck is the basis for the strong attractions that the soul will experience, that will want us to get really close to people that will draw us really deeply into certain experiences. And that attraction, it's almost like we might have a deep emotional catharsis, a deep sense of connection through a feeling of union for a moment. But I often say, you know, the bodies can't get close enough to actually merge. It doesn't actually happen. So there's often this deep sense of catharsis and connection. And it's just in this like pure vibrational place of desire but it doesn't necessarily bring true union. There's still the need to let go. And if we've you know, gone really deeply with someone, they will die at some point or psychological content will come up that will either lead you to wanna to get out of there or they'll wanna get out of there or feelings and desires and dynamics will arise that will bring up psychological dynamics. And so the, the energy of feeling stuck, we often try to deal with it by finding ways to express and actualize a deep desire for closeness. You can think of the eighth house in general and the Pluto Scorpio archetype as reflecting the nature of the soul that wants to belong. Like the soul is desirousness itself. Its very energy is cleaving. It's wanting to cleave. It needs to be directed somewhere. The soul needs to be directed home or not home, right? That's why the soul creates human experience to facilitate its focus. Where does it want to find itself? It can't be without that. And ultimately, all souls are realizing, okay, this desire, this cleaving nature, it's not going to be fulfilled until it cleaves to who it really is. And the energy of concentration is what's of essence here. So you're stuck. You can't get out of this horrible drama of human experience of pain and suffering and desire and loss and hurt and psychological limitations there's no way out but through. And the way that we really work with that is understanding that at the core, this is the soul's journey of awakening to itself, coming home to its true nature. And thus the vehicle of concentration is of essence here. The ability of the soul to concentrate on itself is sort of a narrow passageway that takes the soul through the entrapment, through the stuckness into true freedom ultimately. The concentration on oneself, it reminds me of a really profound quote that I received in my dream some time ago, um, which, which is a constant, um, I'm constantly coming back to this message. Uh, it feels just really profound and potent. The message was, do not extend your eye beyond the one inside of you. And Michelle painted that and she drew, a, drew an eye, you know, an eye, a human eye, 
with the letter I inside of it, because do not extend your I beyond the one inside of you. It's kind of cool. It's like, is that your I or your capital letter I, right? The, the openness of that statement is really beautiful because the I has to go somewhere. The soul needs to direct itself somewhere. Who am I? What am I? And desire is the basis for everything that we direct our attention towards in our life ultimately at the, at the core. So directing the I inside, concentrating on ourself, concentrating on the soul, the soul concentrating on itself, meaning who we are. This is where Jeff Green speaks about in the teachings he brings forward about the ways that evolution happens, that there's this evolutionary process with Pluto, and this can be applied to the eighth house as well, where we are going to be concentrating very deeply on a dynamic that we just can't get out of. It's, we're, it's stuck, it's not moving, and it, it, the more intense it becomes, it's an addiction or a pattern in our life. The more we concentrate, the more potent it becomes to the point where it can become all-consuming. And this concentration has the effect of catalyzing even more process in one's life until eventually there's some kind of union. The eighth house is the house of marriage and divorce. But it's the house of marriage, not because it's about two people getting married necessarily, marrying something outside of you, the deeper metaphor, it's the union of the soul with itself, where all primal opposites are unified, the whole unity of Shiva Shakti, the awakening of the soul to its divine eternal essence. That's the true marriage that's happening. And there's a lot of wisdom that I am um, reflecting on learning about in the eighth house when it comes to the energy of commitment, right? Where we commit to someone or something, but that commitment becomes almost a vehicle for the soul's own awakening to itself because that commitment becomes a way of the soul facing its core fears and psychological patterns of resistance, its jadedness, its distrust. So the vehicle of concentration, the, the journey of concentration is where we work through the entrapment. And this is where we can use the sort of the tantric word. It's like the eighth house is a tantric house in the sense that we're working with the object of desire, but we're staying centered in the soul because everything comes and goes. You can't hold on for something too long. It'll change at some point. So at the core in the eighth house, we're returning to this principle that whatever's meant to stay will stay. Whatever's meant to go will go. I can't, I, I, I quote that Ramana Maharshi quote like all the time. And the reason why I quote that so often is because it's true and it's profound. What's meant to come will come. What's meant to go will go. And also we can't try hard enough to make something happen that won't or prevent something that isn't, that's going to happen to not happen. The reason why I feel that is so profound is because it reflects the understanding that everything follows the program of our soul. The whole world manifests as one with our inner reality. There is no separation between the two, which is why fundamentally it's safe to choose evolution. It's safe to let go. It's safe to face everything and not be afraid of the consequences of what it means. But that determination to evolve is the bottom line. Now let's look at some examples of signs in the eighth house to really exemplify how this works. If you put Aries in the eighth house, then we're going to be looking at the dynamic of the soul needing a lot of freedom to actualize its own desires. And the soul is gonna get itself into situations where it's gonna feel totally stuck, where it's gonna confront its sense of, I can't act here. I don't have the freedom or the ability to make choices here. And so it'll either lose its Aries energy, right? Disempowerment, be in situations where it's not empowered in its capacity to choose Aries. And Aries particularly is self-will, personal desire. Or it'll say, nope, you know, I'm going to resist Aries like a little child and not get into anything that's uncomfortable. But that desire energy of the eighth house will perpetuate this pattern for the soul of being drawn into people and experiences 
from a strong desire nature that it's going to want to explore. And it's going to open up these karmic doors that it's not going to be able to get out of until it really faces itself. Let's flip that. Let's put Libra in the eighth house. Here, Libra in the eighth house in particular is dealing with a strong longing and connection for union with another where there's a need to feel heard and met on a deep permeating level of soul connection. So here we're dealing with the psychology of being listened to and needs being met on a core level. And the challenge here is you find these relationships and then you attach to it, right? And suddenly your deeper soul needs aren't being met. You feel entrapped, like, oh, I have to be something for this person for them to stick with me. Or I have to be something for them to be satisfied. Or on the flip side, I'm holding on to them because I really need their closeness. There can be this deep sense of losing one's psychological energy and power in wanting to hold on to the closeness and the feeling of union that comes. But what happens with the eighth house in general, and this is particularly heightened if you put Venus there or Libra there or Scorpio, Pluto stuff there, is we're going to get ourselves into relationship and it's going to bring a lot of union and connection. But if we're not really doing that soul work, we're going to face the limitations of how good this relationship will make us feel. And so we're going to start desiring other people or other experiences, which could be fine. But if that's not met with honesty, and if it's used as a way to stay in the loop of just following desire and outsourcing one's pattern, it can leave a lot of unresolved karma. So the intention with the Libra eighth house connection ultimately is doing that work in relationship to know that the other person exists simultaneous to your inner soul reality. So it's being able to do that work in relationship where there is a meeting, there's a connection, but a deep capacity to go inside of oneself and to almost die to the other or let go of the other. And that actually allows for a deep sharing and bonding and intimacy to happen. One thing I'll say about the eighth house is the eighth house also corresponds to experiences where we have deep bonds and deep intimacy, deep trust. We build a deep emotional connection with others in the eighth house. And oftentimes that's necessary as a part of the soul's evolutionary journey, that forming attachments, building deep trust with other souls is often a part of the evolutionary program because that creates a foundation where there is adequate safety for the soul to enter into a realm where actually there's no safety. It's a little paradoxical, but it basically says to open up entirely, there needs to be some level of trust and security simultaneous to the recognition, I, I can't, pro, security can never be promised in this world. So there's always this process for the soul of realizing I have to be willing to open up and build trust because the life is never going to do it well enough for me to say, yeah, you can trust now. There's stability. You can open up to your deepest psychological weaknesses. You're not going to be betrayed. Like life will never do that for you. There has to be a willingness to kind of be vulnerable. And that creates a container where we can then actually go a little bit more deeply, but we have to meet our resistance first in building that trust. So oftentimes a big part of the soul work with the eighth house is building um, deep bonds, deep emotional bonds, deep connections that allows for a deeper healing process to occur. Let's look at some other examples. Let's put um, Capricorn in the eighth house. So here the dynamic corresponds to desires around social status, social acknowledgement, being socially approved of, one's status in, in the world. And there can also be strong conditioning around how one needs to be met on a soul level. There can be strong conditioning around the idea of soulmate, around the idea of what loyalty and commitment has to look like, where the fixation on the structures can actually become an obsession where the soul isn't connecting with their self. You know, second house cancer polarity where there's a lack of self intimacy. There can also be very deeply crystallized power dynamics 
where one person holds all the power, the other person is sort of the, the one that's sort of giving in to the other. And oftentimes Capricorn in the eighth house corresponds to a soul that's really needing to unravel this and claim their own authority. You see this with a lot of souls that, you know, kind of unraveling old marriages or abusive relationships or unhealthy addictive patterns, not even to people necessarily, where there's a process of needing to come back to oneself and say, I need to practice and strengthen my own self-authority, follow my own inner guide, not give my power away to something that will make me feel accepted or approved of in the world. And oftentimes with Capricorn in the eighth house, we're learning to build health and strength in the mind relative to where we fell into patterns of addiction, patterns and habits of addictive energy, addictive relationshiping, or even with substances, where it's like, I need to become strong in my soul. Capricorn in the eighth, also Virgo in the eighth, are oftentimes souls that at some point will get really into soul work, doing work as a healer or professionally on behalf of others to help them really go through deeper, darker places. Libra in the eighth as well can oftentimes be people that are soul workers that will do deep psychological therapeutic or psychotherapeutic counseling with others. So at this point, let me open the field and see if anyone wants to ask any questions, um, any chart examples that we can tune into and look at this together. Hi, Ari. Um, Hi. I've got some charts here. Um, this one has two planets in the eighth in different signs. I'd love for you to teach about that. Okay. Is this person here? No. Okay. Oh, this is a friend of mine. <laughs> okay. And Thank they're you. they're cool. They're, are they cool with me to start and to talk? Absolutely. All right. Yeah. So. Um, in general, just when there, are, when there are two signs on any house, the ruler of that house, the sign on that house is a ruler. So it's charging that house. And you look at the planetary ruler of that house, and that gives a lot more context and information for how that house opens up the energy, the framework of that house, what conditions all activity in that house. But you just see, you got to see the context. So here we have Uranus in Cancer in the eighth house. Okay, so like, where's the moon? You know, what's aspecting Uranus? Oh, look, the moon is because the moon rules Uranus, in this case, because the moon rules Cancer. And here the moon's also in the eighth house. So it's actually a very particular configuration where the entire eighth house is strongly conditioned by that Gemini energy, which actually takes us to that square with Mercury, which rules the eighth house. So without having any context for this soul. Um, what's the soul's evolutionary stage? I would say maybe um, between second and third individuated. Okay, great. But still, without having any context for the soul and eighth house being the most vulnerable and intimate and uncomfortable place there is, I'll speak very general terms that with, and let me just actually drop in for a moment and feel the chart. Okay, so it's meaningful to know that the south node is Virgo conjunct Vesta in the 10th house. Uh, Pluto is also there. So there's a strong 10th house orientation for this soul. And this nodal axis squares the ascendant descendant axis. Um, the ruler of that south node is Mercury, which also rules the eighth house and squares that moon. So this Mercury in the fifth house is very essential, very core, understanding some of the core karmic dynamics of this soul. I'll say this first in very general terms, and we'll see if my mind gets more specific. Gemini in the eighth house corresponds to a, a deep, inquisitive desire nature to 
probe the mind into the deeper psychological realms of human experience. So the desires here are oriented towards information and knowledge and wanting to unravel a greater logical understanding of the underlying logic, the, the basic premise for all of existence. So psychologically, the soul is asking a lot of questions and is naturally interested in investigating all things that correspond to the soul or human psychology or human motivations, human addictions. And socially, there is a very strong curiosity nature that will impel a soul to explore different experiences or power symbols or sexuality, wanting to explore what's this all about? And that curiosity can simply start as a superficial interest in looking at different experiences or things or ideas or concepts or chants or mantras or magic practices. But what's happening is it's a way of the soul going deeper into understanding its own mind, understanding the nature of its own mind. And ultimately what's happening in Gemini in the eighth house is we're reaching the psychological limitations of what we can logically piece together. And here the vulnerability with the moon there is there there can be a strong need to feel emotional security and safety and continuity by a way of being able to logically um, have the adequate understanding and knowledge to get to the core of one's own psychological reality and thus feeling like one doesn't know or one doesn't understand can feel very disempowering. And the need to be able to piece things together, the need to be able to probe very deeply and have understanding is important for the moon in this position. What this can speak to is a dissociation with Uranus, and this is, I'm not speaking to Tony, I'm speaking in general right now, but with Uranus and Cancer in the eighth house ruled by the moon, this can speak to situations where there is emotional dependencies, emotional attachments, and um, loss of those connections that was either shocking or alienating to the soul, that which was dependent upon Cancer, that which was home and security. And there's this, this can speak to, in general, sort of... Um, an emotional fracturing and a, a displacement and a dissociation of the emotional body where the soul goes into the mind, goes into a thinking place because there's a deep experience of loss and disconnection. So the work with Gemini in the eighth house, I'm going to drop into it a little more deeply. is to focus the mind on the, the vibration of one's emotional experience and to not get lost in seeking more knowledge or getting lost in the mind. And here with Mercury in the fifth house ruling that, I mean, I can just see in general for the soul, there's a lot of inspired, and a lot of creative energy, right? So having a connection to art and creativity or anything that allows for the mind, in this case, to shift into a more non-local, intuitive, open, holistic state of being where there can be an inspiration and a connection to the heart. I feel like this might be a way of psychologically processing and moving a lot of the energy that can feel confusing or displaced or not fully connected. That's as far as I probably should go without really knowing anything about the soul or what they're working with. But do you want to share anything, Linda? Oh, no, look, that's fantastic. Really brilliant. Thank you so much. Okay. I do have a few other charts here, but it depends on Della and Carolyn if they have any questions. You can think of the moon in general. If you put the moon in the eighth house in general, we're looking at a very delicate situation because the moon wants home security, right? It's where we're finding a sense of safety within ourselves. And at the same time, the eighth house doesn't really promise any kind of stability or security in the ultimate sense. So there's an ultimate journey within the moon in the eighth house of the soul learning to find home within itself. And a lot of times these souls can develop a permeating deep capacity to care for other people in all kinds of situations. Gemini moon in the eighth house can also develop the ability to interact with all kinds of different people and to have the language and the skill set, the knowledge to work with human psychology, human addiction, to have the resources, the knowledge, the information 
that can really benefit people on their own journey. And the moon reflects a deep empathy and care and a sensitivity to the process of evolution. Um, with Delo, Luna, with Pisces moon in the eighth house, that again would reflect the soul that has the ability to empathize very deeply with the collective condition of souls in some of the darkest and most uncomfortable places that we experience. Think of the moon as holding the baby, right? And then the cancer is midwifing of the soul. My like moon in the eighth house is a soul midwife. So any, anyone else want to ask any questions or share anything? I don't have anything in my um, eighth house, but Scorpio is on the cusp. Hi, Ari. Hey. Uh, and I don't know if you see anything. I have a lot of Pluto stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, your Pluto in the in the fourth house uh, with that, you know, Venus stellium, and it's kind of coming out of a square to the nose, but it squares all that Scorpio. And yet it rules your eighth house. This kind of emphasizes the theme that's already existing in your chart. The theme here being about um, the soul empowerment and all, all, all the core pieces of that Pluto work, um, finding home in yourself, um, awakening to the security that doesn't come or go that is inherent to your own being and all the work that you've been doing with that nodal axis, just with it ruling the eighth house, it says at the core, this is so Scorpio in the eighth house obviously speaks to evolutionary experiences that will take us to the core of our deepest fears, the places that feel most uncomfortable. So wherever Pluto is for such a chart, that will really say where these eighth house experiences are coming alive. And yeah, I'm not sure what else I would want to add to that, but it, 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 it makes, it makes it about at the core cultivating on a deeper and deeper level, uh, a greater intensification of I'm going to do whatever it takes to evolve, putting the evolution at the core of your own journey. Um, you know, I would say having Scorpio there just conditions that and emphasizes that intention within your soul even more strongly. And really, if you have strong Scorpio eighth house Pluto stuff in your chart, it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, not all charts are created equal. Not all lifetimes are the same. And it's not necessarily easy. You know, evolution is not easy. Um, no one said it would be. It's not, it's not what it's about. So there are lifetimes where it's really about getting with the program or not. And that's sort of just how it is for these Pluto type souls that have strong Scorpio Pluto stuff going on. And there's the compassion of that too. It's like, we do our best and then life will often catalyze necessary experiences that will maybe often further us along to really go inside, you know? If we're not capable of making the choices that we could make, it's okay because evolution's got our back at some point or another. When it's time, life will show us that it's time. Carolyn, could I ask a question about your chart? Oh, sure. Fantastic. Ari, what about the South Node in Sag transiting Carolyn's eighth house? Oh yeah, great. So South Node in the eighth house corresponds to at this time in your life, there will be a a reliving or a rehashing of all eighth house experiences. So for now, it's your eighth house, which is ruled by your Jupiter, which takes us to, was Jupiter in the sky when you were born? Yeah, oh, yeah, it's right there next to the, the ninth house. Oh, I know you. Jupiter's in your ninth house. We know that about you. Right, so you know, it's really going to speak to you. Here, there is a period of time where the psychological knowledge that in this case connects to spiritual systems of knowledge or ways of connecting with your intuition um, that will be very relevant for your ongoing journey. So this can be if you're teaching, starting to teach soul work, um, accessing information or content in your life at this time that is relevant to any kind of eighth house stuff. And especially as it's getting into Scorpio and it's ruled by Scorpio anyway, the eighth house transit of the south node points us back to whatever psychological content needing to emerge right now for us to release but it can also speak to really important karmic relationships particular attachments and connections that will be 
important along the soul journey, but again, also where we can be releasing. It's like empowering ourselves to live our soul essence in this life, where we just have to play it out and move the energy forward. Eighth house can be fruitive, right? When we have the south node moving through the eighth house, this can be where there are gifts. In this case for you, it's soul insight, it's psychological knowledge and a deeper understanding of truth and the nature of reality. And there can be just this calling for you, either in your own studying or in your own teaching, right? It's like, how is this energy of the eighth house needing to circulate and release? That's the thing with the eighth house. It, it's asking us to evolve and that can mean all kinds of things, but energy needs to circulate. And sometimes the edge, the discomfort in our life experience um, is in putting ourselves in situations where we're going to face our deepest fears and weaknesses. And for you, I always wonder about the teaching piece because we got the Jupiter ruling the ninth house. In this case, it rules part of the eighth house and that's squaring the moon in Virgo, which is where I think all right, a lot of doubt and self-doubt. And have you been teaching or I'm just kind of curious to hear this from you. I was, um, a lot, well, I taught for 26 years, I guess, um, children who teach differently, normal grade four, five, six, seven classes, which I loved, especially when I got into um, teaching kids who learn differently because you could just teach them where they were. And over a number of years, I not now with COVID, but before that, people, women would come and sit on my couch mm and say, and just go on about their marriages. And I've had two, and I'm not very good at it. And people still come and ask me. And all I do is what I did with my daughter when she was a little girl, what I did with my students, my teaching revolves around what do you want? And is the way you're dealing with it going to give you what you want? I don't even think I ask that i love but that you come to me for information and it's like you know i see what people to me in this lifetime what people give up in relationships so i i've been more accepting of living my simple north node in taurus um decluttering my home, making it beautiful. And I think I can hold space when I go into webinars on different topics in my community in the Laurentians. I can hold space. I can sit and meditate and send, I'm a healer. I send energy best I can and to the elementary school across the street where my daughter used to go, and I did some substitute teaching. But I used to say, if I'm not a teacher in the system, am I a teacher? If I'm not a teacher that looks like Ari or Linda or Joe Dispenza, am I a teacher? Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm a teacher, it's just like whoever drives into my driveway the bread together jamie oh, i love that and yeah i do too and it's i wanted a label that i could s hold up and say see i'm worthwhile mm. i don't need that anymore mm. god thinks i'm worthwhile god oh. with god without i love that that's great the, you know, you can think of the eighth house as yeah. Uh, what is it as the the? Pre oh, you broke up a little bit, or maybe I broke up. <laughs> we can think of the eighth house as we're recycling energy. Mm -hmm. And so, just like in the second house, you can be hoarding. The eighth house wants to move things, so releasing, letting it move in the world, letting it process, letting it go, is a big part of that. So it's like. I love the energy that you're sharing around that. And of course, that's like, that's the true teacher. That's, that's real Sagittarius, not trying to be someone, just being natural, being authentic and spontaneous about it. It'd be cool to see how that unfolds for you while the South Node stays in Sag in your eighth house. Okay. 
I'm right now. I'm also Jamie has four kids that she's homeschooling, and um, now I know why I kept all my old teaching supplies mm. that I'm not going to use. Pluto went over my ascendant. I left my career of teaching, a strike, yeah. and I'd done that. I didn't want to do that anymore. Um, so yeah, it's just, I'm just, I'm very open to downloads who needs what and not telling people. I have a friend now in a way I haven't had for years and it's an equal friendship. And we just talk about who we are and where we are. And we both get little downloads and, you know, but it's, um, it's equal. It's equal in a way that I've never I've never felt the ground is becoming less unstable under my feet. The ground has been unstable under my feet all my life. Mm. And now I it's not hearing this, Carolyn, you know, what, you know what this reminds me of, and this feels also just really relevant to your Neptune. Mm. It's like, um, just this prayer that uh, I really value it of just waking up and saying, how can I be, how can I be, how can I be helpful today? How can I be in service today? And, and the, the feeling of enoughness is so, it's so refreshing actually to feel that it's like just, just being able to be available. And I can feel that vibration of however you can be available, however spirit can guide you to be in service. You know, there's something really beautiful about that when there's not a lot of attachment or stress on figuring something greater than that out. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate your teaching so much, Ari. I've benefited for a few years now. And it's yeah, I always love getting to connect with you. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe we have time for one more question or one more chart if anyone wants to share. I have a question, but if anyone else does, go for it. Stella. Hi. So I have Neptune transiting my eighth house. Okay. With and I do have my moon there as well. So Neptune transiting the eighth house speaks to ultimately it points to the soul's ultimate desire to reunite with its source. And so the Neptune longing is this deep longing for connection, for bonding, for intimacy. And the challenge with that is anything Pisces, anything Neptunian, it's like you grab it and it falls out of your fingers. It's like water. You can't possess it. And so this is a potential journey of, of the soul reorienting its attention, its devotion to unify. This is a very devotional particular signature. And with the moon there and Pisces ruling your eighth house, where's your natal Neptune in the fifth house? Yeah. I mean, this, this does to me very much speak to where do we find ultimate meaning in life? The, and this is not necessarily for you necessarily, right? But just the teaching, we can be in a place of deep longing and wanting and that Pisces will never get there. You know, it's like looking for something outside of ourselves to fill that deep eighth house wanting for connection and closeness. The, um, the reorienting of that longing towards, well, what I'm looking for, it must be that there's a greater understanding, there's a greater truth beyond the yearning for it. And we don't end up giving, we don't end up sharing the love that we are when we're looking for it, when we're finding something that we can totally give ourselves to. In general, Pisces in the eighth house, and especially Neptune transiting through the eighth house can be on the one hand, total, you know, you, you meet someone and you completely give yourself to them, you give them all of your money. And then it's a total deceit, deception, right? There might be an, an underhand manipulation or something that you didn't see actually going on. Or it can be the situation where circumstances are bringing a soul deeply to face the truth of its own spiritual longing and to reorient this back to the source, back towards itself. And so to find the love that we are, is to not be seeking it on the outside. And it comes back down to destroy me, <laughs> purify me, right? So that what, whatever's left is just who I am. Like the, the purification through fire is an eighth house thing. 
And then like the love that we are, the essence, the unity of love, that's Pisces. So it's wanting to just give oneself entirely to the truth and to be dissolved in that. So a lot of times Neptune in the eighth house, natally and in transit, can speak to where a soul will find themselves in service of other souls that are going through hard times. Other souls that are working through some of the darkest places of human experience and bringing light there, bringing unconditional love into those places, which is also a way of the soul realizing that it, that it itself is arrived, that it itself is home, that there's nothing to look for, that there is arrival, there is unity. Um, and I always feel your chart. It's like this process of really orienting towards this, this work that wants to be done through you with that 12th house sun, Pisces moon. It's, there's so much strong spiritual energy around being a conduit for something greater than yourself. Okay. Was there someone else? Okay. That's it. No more questions. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining me in today's class. Let me just take a look at my notes to see if there's something that I wanted to say. Yeah. Just to really kind of clarify that one piece, it's like, there's a longing for commitment in the eighth house, but also a fear of entrapment. Just to really appreciate that dynamic. So whatever sign is on the eighth house is where in some way or another, the soul is working with, with those dualities of fearing entrapment, fearing the stuckness that we get into in our life experience, but also wanting deeper connection, deeper cleaving. So it, it's, it's just a really powerful process to work with. Okay. Oh, here's a question. What makes the earth element in the eighth house to orient a soul work? Um, it's because it's work, earth. Uh, not necessarily Taurus, although Taurus can be doing psychosomatic work, right? Where it's working with a physical body or resources or sort of the energetics of the soul being in balance within itself, holding a crucible for our own inner work, like do Qigong or Kundalini work or Tai Chi, right? But Virgo would be, meticulous, right? Like going into the knit grit of deeper psychological processes and also working with the physical. I think, okay, Virgo in the eighth house can be working with different sexual practices, different postures, doing different yoga practices, all different things that will actually bring the soul through connection to the physical into a relationship to the deeper psychological stuff. Also Virgo in the eighth can be simply the path of karma yoga, where the soul is cleaning things up. Like they're cleaning up their life. They were addicted. They were running away through attachment, through addiction, through our substances. And that Virgo is like, okay, I'm going to clean myself up and claim my power. And in that process, they're going to learn to become aware of and take accountability for their energy, their psychological energy and the hurt and the crisis that they create in their life and that of others when they're acting in a way where of, of neglect and not really dealing with themselves, not really dealing with a deep seated sense of imperfection. You know, in Capricorn, it's the same thing. We're learning to become strong and aligned and to claim authority within the soul itself. And so that itself holds a gesture of mastery where souls can actually train other people to develop the, te the technique, the practices, the discipline to become psychologically empowered. So just all of the earth signs in general imply a, a soul really working with either process or form or time or technique or practices. And in particular, Virgo and Capricorn speaks to our work or our service or our roles in life. So that's why I said that. Okay, my friends, good to be with you all. I'll see you at the next class where I will delve into, I believe, the fourth house. Bye. Thank you so much, Ari. Would you all please thank Ari Measurewolf? Thank you, Ari. That was excellent as always.